Hi, I want to welcome everybody. I'm Suzanne Hurton Roberts. I'm still president of WAPA. <laughs> um, and I uh, just want to say we do have a full and a very interesting uh, program today. Um, I believe Joanne put it together. Thank you, Joanne. And with Kathleen's, uh, help. with Kathleen's help. Okay. Always, everything happens with Kathleen's help. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank all of you for coming. I'm not going to take any time. Um, I do want to say that this is the last um, WAPA meeting of the season, but we are going to have an outing, and Martha Hare will tell you about that um, later. Um, it's going to be in June, so pay attention and be ready. Okay, thanks. Joanne? Great, thank you. Well, thanks to all of you to come for coming to this. Um, this is anthropology as a business, not in the business of or, or anthropological things about businesses. Mm -hmm. So the genesis of this, we've got a wonderful set of folks here um, representing a lot of different kinds of businesses that anthropologists rent one, run, and I'll tell you about that a little bit more in a minute. But the genesis of this was a conversation um, that several of us had a while ago about starting our own businesses. Because um, actually, I think it might have been a conversation I was having with Jeannie at some point. Um, but I was commenting that probably close to 10 years ago, somebody suggested I incorporate. And I had, like many of the people on the screen, you know, off and on worked for myself as, as a independent contractor between jobs working for others. And I thought, okay, why? And somebody convinced me that this would be a wonderful thing and I'd make lots of money and I could be an MBE and all of these good things and I should go do this. And so I did um, and discovered that it was really not like being an independent contractor in lots of different ways, um, including and especially the minute you incorporate under this fancy name with this beautiful logo and this new website, everybody decides that everything you did for the 30 years prior doesn't count because you're a new entity, right? <laughs> um, and so what we wanna do today is give all of you an opportunity to hear from people who run different kinds of businesses who are anthropologists. And we've got a wide range from, you know, what is considered the typical thing that you would see, cultural resources management, which would be Jeannie Ward, um, to Neil and Kathleen, who, I don't know, is this one of the oldest anthropological um, consulting firms in the country? I'm not sure. It's yeah? the oldest. Yeah, it is the oldest. So are we. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But um, and then Suanna and Matt, who are sort of taking anthropology in a wonderful new direction. So we're going to hear from each of them um, in turn. And so what I asked them to do, or Kathleen and I asked them to do, is first of all, talk a little bit about their business and how it, it happened and a little bit more of it as a business. Um, and then to answer three questions. Why did you decide to start a business and how is it different than freelancing or working for someone else? What is the best thing about being in business as an anthropologist? And what advice do you have for someone thinking about going into business as an anthropologist? So on that note, um, what I'm going to do is introduce each of our speakers as soon as I find the bios. Uh, and I think I'm going to start with Jeannie, um, who is sitting in a working archaeologist's office. So you get to, a view of what this really looks like. Um, and Judy Word is president and principal investigator um, of... Our Applied Archaeology and History Associates, Inc., which is a cultural resources management consulting firm. 
Um, she's got over 40 years of professional experience. Um, and her academic credentials include a BA in anthropology of, from University of Georgia, an MA in anthropology from uh, Tennessee, Knoxville. Her experience encompasses both historic and prehistoric archaeology and historic structures identification and evaluation. Projects have ranged from cultural resources sensitivity studies through location and identification surveys, evaluation of significance, National Register of Historic Places nominations, and large-scale data recovery excavations. Ms. Ward's uh, professional qualifications exceed, exceed all U.S. Department of Interior criteria for archaeologists and historians. In addition, addition she's a registered professional archaeologist. Have to hear what that means. Uh, a National Evaluation Certification of Professional Qualifications. She is author, co-author, or contributor to over 350 uh, CRM reports and has presented numerous papers at professional conferences. Now, before I turn it over to Ginny, a little housekeeping. Um, please, folks, let's not use chat um, to ask questions, et cetera. You know, let's just kind of wait until um, everybody's had a chance to talk. And, um, and then we can actually talk to each other as opposed to chatting. Um, and what I'm going to do is give people a couple minutes for very specific technical questions for this for each speaker, and then we'll just save the rest of it for conversation at the end. So on that note, Jeannie, you're on. And you're on mute. <laughs> Somebody muted me. My name is Jeannie Wolf. And I am, as Joanne said, the president and owner of Applied Archaeology and History Associates, Inc., which has been a business in Maryland since 1998. I had a previous business in Pennsylvania, which I shut down when I, I moved in, in a previous life. But I've been here for 24 years. And I mostly started this business because... We moved here and I couldn't get another job. That was essentially it. And I couldn't go work where my husband, my then husband was working because of nepotism issues and it's just as well. But uh, I started it just as someone else had retired. So I picked up her client or some of her clients. And uh, that client, my first client is still my client. We're doing a project for him right now. But my company is, according to federal standards, very, 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 very small. I do less than a million dollars a year. I have 10 full-time employees. My employees have benefits. They have a 401k and health insurance and days off and holidays. And I also pay for disability and both long-term and short-term for them. We do hire a lot of temporary archeological technicians, but I have a full-time staff of about 10. We just spent last week moving our office and this is just my home office. This is not my office office. We just moved into a space that's 2,600 square feet with actual offices with doors and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the doors is, is a nice thing. So you can like have a conversation without the whole world hearing it. <laughs> yeah. my, my lab director is beside herself because she has both a wet lab and a dry lab and room to store stuff. So that, that is going to be a big change for us and hopefully to help us grow. But my business concentrates on terrestrial archaeology. We, if we have to have underwater components, we hire an underwater archaeologist if we... Uh, need to have uh, official architectural history done. We hire architectural historians because we don't have one on staff yet. But one of the other fields that we'd really like to be able to hire that we're ha we have a hard time sourcing is uh, oral historians, particularly oral historians that work with the African-American community as unfortunately like a whole lot of archaeology, everyone in my firm is white. And I don't feel like it's appropriate to do 
African American history if you're not from that community, if you can't help it. So if, if any of you out there are considering a, a life in, arch, in oral history, you know, it, it's in great demand right at the moment. But my, my little firm had, I started out just making enough money to keep myself busy while my happily now ex-husband um, brought in the real money. But that didn't last too long. And by, you know, 2001, it was just me and my couple kids. And one of the best reasons to own your own firm is that you're your own boss. And because of that, I was able to do everything I needed to do for my kids. I was, I, at that time, I, I pretty much worked alone and was working from home. So I could you know, see them to school and get them off school and you know, do, do what I needed to do for the rest of the day. I was available to do what they needed for school. But, and one of the reasons that was so easy for me is because the legislation behind what I was doing in my early years was local. Anne Arundel County, which is where I live, <clears throat> has local legislation that required developers to do archeological investigations to get permits to subdivide properties. And I did that almost exclusively from 1998 to 2008. And it kept me in a pretty good living. But in 2008, the housing industry of course collapsed and along with it collapsed my business. So in 2008, I went and got my uh, WBE status, which is woman-owned business enterprise, which qualifies as a disadvantaged business enterprise, which allows me to uh, get set-asides for disadvantaged businesses, of which Maryland's state goal now is 25% of most contracts. So I am a sub-consultant on a couple of contracts with the state Maryland State Highways Department. I'm subcontracted on some local, you know, open end contracts. And I've done a couple of, you know, straight with the federal government kind of projects, which is interesting and hard because you're know, just getting paid by the federal government's a pain in the butt. But uh, that's my business and its history. My, I, I also, I have a SBA 8A which is a special category for disadvantaged businesses. And there's, they can, the federal government can set aside entire contracts just for eight A's as long as there's more than one who wants to bid on it. And I have not managed to leverage that status very much in part because I think I got it far too soon. I was too small to, to do that when I did it and it only runs for nine years. So it's about to run out, but I did not do much freelancing or, or you know, I guess I did a little bit of freelancing early on but I've always just owned a business and my business is a corporation. I'm an S corp, which means all of the money, all of the taxes kind of run through me personally. And right at the moment, we're trying to figure out how to you know, do some succession planning to make it so I can retire in a few years and sell the business to my staff, hopefully. But uh, I worked for other people. I, it was okay. I didn't like it that much. I am, I guess, too big of a control freak to have other people telling me what to do. So. This has worked for me for most of my life at this point, and I recommend it. But I guess the best thing about being in business as an anthropologist slash archaeologist is I feel like what we do, a lot of times everything we do just goes on a shelf or actually into a computer at this point in some facility, and no one is ever going to look at it again. Or if they look at it, at it in 10 years, they'll say, <laughs> we're so much better now, which is what I do about my own work from 20 years ago. But 
since almost everything we do is in advance of development, it means that all of the information we're pulling from the ground is destroyed now. It does not exist anymore except for in our reports and in the assemblages we've sent for curation. And I expect that at some point, somebody will pull all the information that we've been pulling out of the ground for the last 50 years as, as an industry and actually be glad that they have it when you know Anne Arundel County's practically paved over all the way at this point. So I guess that's one of the things I'm proud of. I think I've I've managed to save some of the country's archaeological legacy for the future. And let's see, the last question. What advice do I have for someone thinking about going into business as a we'll say CRM archaeologist is that this is an awesome time to be thinking about being a CRM archaeologist. As I said, the, the National Historic Preservation Act passed a little more than 50 years ago, and a lot of us got into business about then, which means that a lot of us are retiring. And <clears throat> I'm ready to retire and I want to sell my business to my staff. So it is a very good time to come into a business. And it's also pretty darned easy to start your own CRM business. I mean, the, the cash outlay is minimal. All, all you pretty much need is a shovel and a screen and a computer. Well, the, these days you need a GPS unit, but that that's kind of new. But I mean, getting into the business is relatively easy. It's not the mass, most profitable industry you could ever go into. I mean, pe people don't do this because they want a big pile of money. Some people make more than others, and I'm finally making a decent living 24 years into this. But I mean, you have to have a bachelor's just to go dig holes, and those jobs only pay between 15 and $18 an hour. And then you have to have a master's in order to do anything even like standing and watching other people dig because you need a master's to meet the Secretary of Interior Standards as an archaeologist. And you have to have that in order to be an official archaeological monitor, even though most of what we do during those things is stand there and watch other people dig. So <clears throat> I don't know how long I've gone on at this point, but I'm not sure I have that much more to say. I, I will be more than happy to answer questions. And if anybody out there, I don't know who, how, how many people are out there, wants a job, let me know. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, so and does anybody have any very specific technical questions for Jeannie? It's stuff about starting a business and stuff or CRM in general, we wanna wait. Anybody? specific ones. And I'm not sure that I can see hands given the way this is set up. Yep. Ed. Hey, great. Yeah, use the raise hand. Well, Ed, but he also, if you use the raise hand, it makes it so much easier. Okay, so Ed? Uh, thanks for that a uh, great introduction to your business, Jeannie. I wonder if you could say a few words about RPA and the certification and what that's meant um, in terms of uh, get your business and, uh, and helping you get more business. Okay, the RPA is the Register of Professional Archaeologists. It's the successor to the Society of Professional Archaeologists. They tightened up their criteria and essentially you have to apply for membership, which requires you meet certain criteria for having done field work and supervised and written a master's thesis and those kind. Of, there's a few people who are you know, grandfathered in, but essentially it just says it's an official certification that you're a professional archaeologist, which can save a few steps. And in my case, you know, when I'm going up with all these people who are licensed engineers and have all those letters after na their name. It's useful to have a few letters after my name too. And there are some states that actually require you to be a registered professional archeologist to do business in the state. 
California being one of them. So, but they 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 are doing now uh, continuing education credits. So we're we're going to have to start keeping up with that. And oh, the other thing I forgot to talk about: I, my firm is a member of the American Cultural Resources Association, which is the trade firm for CRM, and it does it includes both the the buildings people and the dirt people and the water people, but it also includes the ethno historians and the geophys and you know anyone who who can fit into need, needing to you know needing to be on a CRM contract. We have members there, and it is a great place to look for a consultant if you're looking for one. We have about 200 members at this point, I think. And it's great for networking and getting to know other consultants in the country. If you go to the conference, everybody has the same problems and you can team up for job opportunities too. Great, thank you. All right, I think we're gonna move on now to um, cultural and social and to LTG. Um, so um, Neil and Kathleen are um, founders and managing partners of LTG Associates, the oldest anthropological based consulting firm in, the, in North America. For four decades, they've led projects uh, Neil's led, and and um, I'll let you guys explain. <laughs> but they've led projects that help to shape policy and services that affect the health and welfare of minority and at-risk communities. Clients have ranged from community-based organizations and foundations to local, state, federal, and international agencies. In addition to being an active social scientist, Neil is, is responsible for oversight of the administrative functioning of the firm. Neil is past president of the National Association of Practicing Anthropology, a past member of the American Anthropological Association Executive Board, a current member of the Board of the Society for Applied Anthropology. He's a longstanding member of WAPA and chairs the, WNAP the NAPA Mentor Program, which matches new and young professionals with seasoned professional anthrop anthropologists. And he co-chairs the NAMPA committee responsible for the annual careers expert. Kathleen has been engaged in SCORES projects in international, federal, state, and local government organizations and with for and nonprofit organizations and foundations. In addition to being an active social scientist working on projects, Kathleen is responsible for the development side of the firm. She is current president of National Association of Practicing Anth Anthropologists, a past member of the SFAA Nominations and Elections Committee, past chair of NAPA Committee responsible for Careers Expo, a founder of the NAPA Mentor Program, a longstanding and proud member of WAPA, and a current member of the WAPA Program Committee. So Neil and, and Kathleen, I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you all. We're very pleased to be here. We have a few slides that we're going to go through. Um, just some illustrations. So I will show my screen. That's not the screen I want to show. There we go. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. We're good. Okay, good. So you've you've heard the WAPA questions, and we're going to go to the business summary. We have a great history. We've been at this for 40 years. Uh, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary beginning of the year. And we like to talk about our history in terms of periods of work, content areas. Next slide, please. Uh, we worked in refugee resettlement and community development. That's where we started. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the assistance, evaluation, and technical assistance. Uh, we've done a lot of work internationally on concept development, program monitoring, and evaluation. And we are currently working in community family strengthening and faith based work. Uh, throughout all of this, the anthropology of what we've done has been critical. It's also been the delight of doing the work. 
Next slide. So the question about what we do, what we've done, and with whom was one that WAPA asked us to address. And before anybody tells me that these are not mutually exclusive categories, we know that. Um, life is not linear, and neither have we been. Um, so Neil talked about our history. The graphic is intended to help to situate our work around our anthropology. And as can be seen, it includes people, institutions, and tools. And it's been a complicated history of what we've done. We've used the tools and skills of anthropology in everything that we do, whether it's advertised or not. We actively use the tools of assessment, monitoring, and evaluation as a regular part of what we offer to clients. We're frequently called upon to act as organizational therapists, largely, we believe, because we've taken, we take a global perspective and account for context and culture when providing support. And Neil referenced faith-based work. We're not a faith-based organization, but we have worked in faith communities for much of our 40 years, and we think this is because people find us non-judgmental. We are a, an S corporation. We have been incorporated for the 40 years, uh, and we have the attendant members, uh, bankers, lawyers, accountants, um, overseers, and other people who make sure that we walk the straight and narrow and that we are audit proof at all times. And that's part of being in business is being sure that you walk that line and you know where the line is. Those are two different functions. And one of our first hires as an organization was an accountant, and the second was a contracts management person, because we knew what we didn't know. And we determined that we were not going to be those people who got into trouble because they didn't know enough to hire the right people. And so we have, we have hired judiciously. <laughs> In the best of all manner, um, all of these things are certification statuses that we have developed over the years. Um, Joanne spoke about the 8A program, uh, Woes being women owned small business status and small disadvantaged business. These are all small business administration certifications. And most of all of us would qualify for some or all of these statuses over time. It does give you an advantage for bidding with the federal government and some state governments. And it's a lot of paperwork to fill out. Um, when we were filing our 8A, I had to find my grandparents' passports in order to certify that I was not an American, that I was a Japanese American. Now, how many of you have your grandparents' passports handy or their birth certificates? Um, the next one, two, three, four, five, five elements are things that you need to do if you're a federal government contractor. Uh, there are all kinds of things they mean. There are all kinds of forms you fill out. <laughs> OPM and DUNS people annually, and that makes me nuts because I forget till I get the email reminder that I haven't filed our appropriate papers. Um, the next set in yellow are all human subjects protection issues. Uh, FWA is a federal-wide assurance of human subjects participation and protection. City, ACRP, and PHRP are organizations that certify you for having taken human subjects protection training. Um, at the least, ACRP is the least expensive. They're probably 50 bucks. City is 10,000 bucks for an organization. Uh, we're also a prime contract holder, and we are also registered for state and local jurisdictions. This is a lot of paperwork to keep up, and we have file drawers full of stuff. Um, one of the things that happened to us, we grew at one point, and we were a relatively large small business. And what I recognized was that most of my day was spent talking to accountants, human, rela human relations staff, 
uh, bankers, lawyers, and people of that ilk. Uh, managing a business was a full-time business. And Kathleen and I were walking down the hallway of one of our offices, and we recognized that we didn't know who was working for us or what they did. And so we said, when we finish these two major contracts, we're going to downsize. And we started getting smaller purposefully. Um, we got to the point where we could actually do the work. We could be anthropologists. And that has been soul satisfying. And that's why we created our LTG in the first place, was to do the anthropology of what we do. Unfortunately, a lot of these certifications and statuses we still need to maintain as a small business. And they're just as painful whether there's 10 of you or there's 150 of you. You still have to go through all the forms. So why start a small business? Um, it's a really good question. And on Monday mornings, I often ask myself that question. Uh, we should have been a nonprofit organization, but we agreed when we began the business that we did not want to walk into our offices on a Monday morning and hear that the board had met over the weekend and they had a brand new vision of where we were going. And it wasn't where we had planned to go. And that really was the fork in the road for us because we had been organizational consultants for nonprofits for a long time, each of us in our different, in our different areas. And that really was the moment when we said, okay, we're gonna do something different. And so we incorporated as a, uh, a small business, as a C corporation in the state of California. Um, any, any business accountant or business advisor will tell you that we made some immediate uh, wrong turns, including incorporating in the state of California, which is, has a very high tax rate. Um, we have maintained that for 40 years. The reason I think the very biggest reason to have your own business is independence. And I think you'll probably hear that. You've heard it from Joanne, you heard it from Jeannie. Uh, it's the independence to create your own path, to make your own mistakes. And we've made plenty of mistakes. Um, to hire the people you want to hire. And I said to somebody on a call today, we no longer work with anybody we don't like. We're old and cranky. And if we don't like them, we won't work with them. And that includes other organizations and it includes individuals. Um, it's just, we've been at a long time. The big differences between nonprofits and for-profits, uh, a nonprofit is run by the board on behalf of the public and it's licensed by their home state and subject to the US tax code governing 501c3 and like organizations. It allows some tax benefits, but also significant oversight. Um, they can make a profit, but it may not be distributed to the board and advocacy is limited. Now, you think I would contrast that immediately with what a for-profit can do. Ah, uh, but it's not such a clear contrast. Advocacy is a challenge. And we sometimes sign agreements that say we will not be advocates in a particular arena. Um, it is also not smart business sometimes to be an active advocate on some issues. So we go off and in our private lives, we are deeply engaged in advocacy, but then we turn to our business side and we are largely neutral, except on particular issues. For-profits are run for the benefit of the shareholders and have different oversight. And those are differences. But the insurance is probably the most critical reason for becoming uh, a business. So what's the best thing about being in business as an anthropologist? Neil, you go first. 
Kathleen, I think you accidentally muted. Work with people you know well. And so as you're sorting through what's going on around you, who do you reflect with? Who do you trust enough to say, I think this person's losing their mind? Well, I don't think you can work with the organization. Or we made a really bad choice here. How do we get out of this mess? Um, you can't go home and talk to your spouse. You can't talk to your staff about some of this stuff. But having a partner who shares all of this and your anthropological perspective makes all the difference in the world. The other thing that I think has been deeply gratifying about being an anthropologically based consulting firm is choosing complex wicked problems that use the best of our skills and experience and push us to and sometimes beyond our limits. Uh, all of the subjects that you saw close to the beginning of this, the slides, have been complex and wicked problems. And they, they truly challenge us, but our anthropological tools are critical to get to having really good responses. And so being there, being in the game, we think is really critical. So. Also, one of the things, um, on a series of video calls for our project today, I was speaking with two organizations working with Afghan refugees and the community-based organizations. I was speaking with a different organization that's working with Ukrainian refugees. And I was working with another group who's working with Haitians. The world comes to us in this country, the world with all of its problems and challenges, and is yelling and screaming for anthropological engagement. You can't ask for a better job. And in a lot of ways, these organizations and people are the best people to work with. They take you to the streets, they show you their communities, and they ask us how to help them explain what's happening and why they're making a difference. Advice um, a little, but we've already, we've already foreshadowed that. Um, know what you know how to do and know what you don't know how to do and be sure you get good advice about what you don't know how to do. Um, invest in that, you will sleep better. Um, join a network of anthropologists who are doing business because we we do support one another. That's the quick the quick advice. With that, back to you. Thank you. That was great. Um, so, any specific technical questions for Neil and Kathleen before we go on to our next speaker? Anybody? Nope. Okay. All right, so now we're going to, oh, Andrea. Okay, yeah. Hi, sorry. I just, um, I wondered if, um, is it Kathleen could, or Neil could talk about being those organizational therapists? Because I can see mm -hmm. how in consulting work, your time could get taken up with other things that maybe aren't on the scope of work. So mm -hmm. how do you how do you kind of navigate that and in, in maybe some insight into what that is? Great question. It's a great question. It's also a very complicated one. Um, in some cases, people bring us in because they have problems with their organization. And uh, we have you know, a stream of work that we've done over the years that has included helping people to unknot themselves from what they've gotten into. Uh, we've also been given carte blanche to go through organizations and figure out what's going wrong, as well as what their strengths are. Um, we try not to mix that with straight line evaluation 
But if we find that there are organizational issues and that's not unusual, we'll bring it to the client and we'll say, this is an issue. We can pursue it, but it's going to be new scope. And if you don't want us to pursue it, we're going to put a pin in this, but we're going to say, this is an issue that you're going to need to deal with because you have this problem running in the background or this dissonance going on and it's going to derail you know, this effort that you're trying to make. Being as, and, and this was not always the way we, we're not really taught how to parse those things. And at the beginning, we would just say, oh, well, we'll deal with that, not a problem. Um, and you're off scope and you're out of money and um, you're telling the client something that startles them, none of which are good things. And so being transparent, talking with the client, while making sure that you're not sharing confidences that you shouldn't be, um, is the way that we've worked. We've worked that out. Another part of that are your anthropological networks. And turning you're muted. A... No, we can hear. Are you getting muted? You're fine. Okay. Okay. Um, that is, it's no, now he's muted who are in this room to share those concerns and say, now what in the world do I do? Where do I go? Who do I turn to? And the answer may be go back to the client and say, here's a problem just like Catherine was describing. But you've got a wealth of information in the WAPA network who has got all kinds of experience. It's just pushing the right button and saying go. Great, thank you. All right, so when we think about anthropology, we think about us in, in many different ways. And one of the things that I think is, is really special is that anthropology contributes in its own way to a number of different things. And I think there are a number of people um, in the audience, as well as on, on the speaking panel, who have worn a number of different hats and called themselves a number of different things. I, for one, you know, have always been interdisciplinary. I've always said, you know, I do policy, I do urban studies, I do other things, but I intentionally chose to get a degree in anthropology, not sociology, for a reason. So, the two folks I wanted to to now, Matt and Suanna, are taking anthropology or anthropological training and ideas in very different ways. And I'm not going to try to describe that. I'm just going to let them talk. <laughs> so I think we're going to start with Matt. Um, and Matt Arts is head of product at Art Matcher and founder of anthro to ux and Azimuth Labs. He's a business and design anthropologist, consultant, entrepreneur, author, speaker, and creator. He's the head of product for Art Matcher and the founder of Anthro, okay, I've just said that. He holds an MS in Applied Anthropology, um, an MBA in Finance and Management Information Systems, a BS in Biotechnology, and a BBA in Computer Information Systems. He is also the creator and host of Anthropology and Business and Anthro to UX podcasts and has given talks about his research and work at TEDx, South by Southwest, the Global Business Anthropology Summit, SFAA, AAA, and why the world needs anthropologists. Okay, Matt, you are on. Thanks, Joanne, and thanks, Wapa, for having me. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending as well. So... You know, I think I need to go back a little bit. I know this is very much about anthropology, but I, I think there's, there's something that's worth pointing out in my story, which is the first business I started actually, I would describe at this point as a failure. I mean, there's things I learned and it was productive, but so I want to kind of touch on that before getting into what I'm doing today. And to set the stage for that, I think it's worth saying that I started studying business. You know, I had always intended to working in business. And I went back, as you heard, to study anthropology, specifically to bring research into what I was already doing in the tech sector. I've always worked in tech in one way or another, 
whether that's in software engineering or digital marketing or generally speaking, kind of bringing all of that together. Um, and so when I was an undergrad in my business program, I, I was enrolled in my business program and my biotech program at once, there was a local uh, business competition. And so I entered based upon some research I was doing with gel electrophoresis. I had cut the time of that process in half. And so I entered this business competition. I came out second. I had you know a fair amount of money with that. I filed a patent and I was going through and all was well. But I was young. And though I had a fair amount of money from the competition, I really didn't have enough to take this product and turn it into a manufactured product and compete with you know the companies, uh, you know, very large companies within this space. So basically I got a little scared. And I kind of dragged my feet and, you know, time went by and I sort of let the patent lapse. And I, in retrospect, I think I wish I didn't do that. I wish I at least finished the patent because MIT has since cited in one of theirs. But nonetheless, I sort of, I would describe it as a failure. But from that, I learned a lot about moving quicker and, you know, really finding a focus uh, basically a strategic position that you can really protect and get into. And at that point, I don't think I could have protected that position. And so I took the remainder of the funds that I had after going through the patent process and a few other things. And I essentially, I should say that that first company was an S corp as well. Other people have mentioned, I essentially, you know, through some tax treatment, transferred all the assets into a new S corp and started a digital marketing firm, which I know sounds completely different. But you know, I had experience in sort of both of these areas, and so I, you know, I grew up with computing, and I just rolled right into something I did for fun, in a sense. And I, I, you know, I did this work for some other people, just kind of like freelancing, if you will, and was helping a lot of people locally. So I started up my own firm. That was another S corp. I grew that, hired. Uh, eventually sold that to a software engineering firm, technically the firm that I'm a minority uh, owner in today. And I've been now there 11 years, 12 years, 11 or 12 years. And we in that organization build software products. Art Matcher, which is our latest product that we're spun out into a new um, new LLC, is primarily what I work on the majority of my day. But as you heard, I also have these other entities, these other business entities or these other brands, pretty much all bundled under an LLC today, which at this point is getting a little messy because I'm starting a couple and I'm going to break that out actually over the next few months. But basically, I, I have this minority interest in a software engineering firm and, and you know, we have a staff um, everybody obviously has you know, benefits and at times we've been as many as it was upwards of 40 employees at one point before we sold a previous software product that we built in the energy space. Now we are much smaller. We're down around eight people at this point. Um, and, you know, scaling up and scaling down happens naturally in business as you grow, you know. And so now that we're building this new product, we're likely going to sort of scale the team back up. But so I do that. And in that role, though you might, you know, though you would describe me as a minority owner, I still have a high degree of influence and get to bring the anthropological mindset to this role in that position of head of product and experience, I essentially get to dictate what we build, what we, you know, essentially the, the research design and leading the man, you know, managing the process of software engineering to ship you know, products. Um, and so as a result, I get to make sure that the research is conducted in a way that seems fit for the need at the time, that those insights are really embodied and show up in the product design and make sure that, you know, as we go through the software engineering process, everything can stay aligned. And so by having this degree of influence, um, I get to make sure that we, you know, that I get to help put out something into the world that I think is going to be useful. So even though in that job, you would say I'm not like a full or not the majority owner, having influence, you know, in this way is very, I think, beneficial to the cause that we're all trying to do, which is in many ways better the world. Then on the other side where, you know, in my just my personal consulting, I am really, I have a sort of a long-term vision, like seriously, like a 20-year vision here. I'm mostly doing that as a quote-unquote side hustle because I know that I want to go back to full-time consulting and teaching 
at a later stage of my career, um, you know, as, as my sort of two primary things at, at some later point. And so I have been taking on, you would say, passion projects over the last number of years to continually building a brand, you know, building a portfolio. Most of that is in the research space, but every once in a while, some other things pop up that I get involved in, some like web work here or there, because I've had a long history in doing that for both work and pleasure. Um, and I am more or less building this other portion of my life on the side, again, as a side hustle, so that when I want to sort of flip the, the script and do that full time again, I have it there and I don't need to build it at that moment. And so that's, you know, one of my recommendations for later is to consider that you can do both. So that's sort of the story of me starting businesses. Just to elaborate um, the on, on, with my personal stuff, the two brands that were mentioned in the, in the introduction, Azimuth Labs is basically the research arm, if you will. And then Anthro to UX is really career coaching, specifically focused on helping get other anthropologists into UX because UX or you know, it's it's a wonderful field providing family sustaining salaries, and you can have a, again a high degree of influence in that you contribute to the research that impacts the designs of software products that go in, out into the world. And software is obviously sort of eating up the world at this point in time. And so I am dedicated to helping people make that transition, as well as the transition, not even just to UX. I mean, I'd be very happy to work with anybody really to help them get from a from an academic place to a practicing place. Um, mostly focused on UX, but I think really, you know, getting anthropologists into any role is valuable considering we know how few jobs there are in academia today. And that's a little bit of the history of, you know, what I've started and why. In terms of what I think, you know, how it differs from like freelancing or working for someone else, I, I touched a little bit on that, but I'd also maybe just say that, like, I think the distinction between freelancing and running your own business is not that grand, you know, it's, you could make the argument that maybe one involves incorporating uh, and maybe you would make the argument that maybe freelancers are acting as just sole proprietors under their personal name. That could be a distinction, but I, I say that they're similar in that you are responsible for business development, for, you know, assuming you're not hiring, like Kathleen mentioned, accountants and, and so on and so forth. No, you're going to be responsible for a lot of administrative tasks that you need to take on. and that involves new skills unless you're going to hire for them but so there's a similarity whether you're freelancing as a sole proprietor or you've incorporated as a small business uh, maybe as a team of one initially and then growing from there but they they are in both cases then very different than working for someone else of course uh, i think both have opportunities uh, and you know there's pros and cons of each today is very much about running your business and so what i would say there is that um, you know, if you're going to do it, it probably does make sense to incorporate in some sense for for the legal protection you get in terms of liability. And so, you know, seek out the advice of maybe people on this call or an attorney, also talk to an accountant and, and appreciate why that is valuable. You know, you do want to shield yourself from some concerns if something ever happened. So in terms of why it's also different from working for others, I mean, of course, there's the influence aspect but there's also the fact that, you know, you, again, you have to go out, you have to find your own business, you get to, but you get to pick the clients you want to work for, you get to hire who you want to hire, as others have said. And so you basically get to really control your own destiny. Now, on the flip side, just to point it out, maybe you want more of a dedicated salary, you know, maybe you're trying to buy a house and you need a steady stream of income to demonstrate, and maybe you want to start working somewhere else, and then again, move into your own organization maybe doing it as a side hustle, as I'm saying. Um, again, I appreciate this is about running your own business and I encourage many people to do that. It's a really nice opportunity in life. Just want you to actually have a full picture of some of the pros and cons as well. So in terms of the next question, best thing about being in business as an anthropologist, you know, I think it's the ability to ensure that the anthropological perspective is, you know, is involved in the process. Um, you know, the comparative nature, the holistic view, you know, all the, all the sort of hallmarks of anthropology. By running your own business, you again, really make sure you get to bring that perspective to the world and try to do good again, as many of us are. Uh, if you're working in an organization, you might get to do that to some degree, 
but maybe not always. You know, I have heard stories of people in UX who say produce some insights. Those insights go, you know, I should just caveat it. It depends on the organization and the way the organization is structured. But sometimes roles are kind of siloed. And so in the story I was about to say, sometimes, you know, you produce these insights as a researcher, you might throw it over the sort of the proverbial wall to a product manager, and they may or may not choose to do anything with those. And so, again, if you would like to have a high degree of influence, running your own business and making sure that we can bring those values of anthropology, I think is one of the best aspects of it. Um, and then also just the fact that whether we're, you know, whether we are engaged in services, a service business or a product business, we basically get to really just make sure that we're doing work in a humanistic way. Uh, that there would be probably a fair critique out there that some organizations are not always operating in that way. Um, now, I just mentioned the difference between service and product organizations, and I think that that's, that's relevant because as anthropologists, probably many of you do think of being in a service organization, right? starting your own research practice, and that's great. That's all good and well. You know, I do that. Uh, but on the, on the art matcher side of my life, I'm in a product business. So we are building product that we've taken to market. You know, we, we launched at Art Basel in Miami this past December. We've since uh, then been in the pitch competition at South by Southwest. You know, we're now in deep talks with some art fairs about partnering with them. And if, you know, all these things go as we would like or as we expect, we're gonna have the opportunity, well, we'll have a product in the market that we think can contribute to overcoming some of the issues of diversity and inclusion in the art market. And that's that's really meaningful because you know everybody today is using technology or software. Uh, software, you know, in the form of web delivered apps or mobile apps, right? Software is everywhere today. Companies that you never thought would get into the into the software business are building their own custom software. And so it's everywhere at this point in time. And so being in the product space is a nice opportunity to have to reach a lot of people with what you create service can as well, but product is something that I don't think we should discount. And then building on that in terms of advice, again, I've kind of peppered in a few of these, these comments already, but don't just think of the research practice. Think of, you know, going into other roles. You could found an organization that gets involved in many things, such as building a software product, you know, doing, um, you know, any kind of consulting. It doesn't have to be research per se. Like maybe you happen to be really good at creating content. Um, and, you know, maybe you can use your anthropological mindset to help people with a content marketing strategy. Or maybe you happen to be really detail oriented and you think you could, again, take your anthropological mindset to, you know, some kind of project or product management consulting where your understanding of organizations might lend itself to managing, you know, groups as a consultant or processes or, you know, the development process of something like software. But there's many ways to think about this other than selling the, the service of research. You could use your mindset to do many other things. And, you know, the area that I'm in a product management with Artmatcher is, is a great one for anthropologists to be thinking about. Uh, I what I particularly find interesting about product management, and you can get into that as a consultant or working somewhere, is that it's the role that is it's sometimes described as the mini CEO of a product, and you essentially sit between all of the business units. Traditionally, it's kind of referred to as sitting between like you know your traditional business units, tech, design, more increasingly data science, and you need to learn the language of each other. You need to do cultural brokering to get everybody to work together well. You know, you need to understand the consumer because you're going to be involved in marketing and, and you know, basically bringing a product to market and scaling it, you know, getting it adopted and scaling it. And so it really allows us as anthropologists to, to express a lot of the skills that we have uh, in a very fun and kind of creative way that touches a lot of lives. And you could, again, do that as a consultant or you could do it technically somewhere else. Um, I think doing it as a consultant is a nice opportunity. And that's one of the things that I consult organizations on. And my last um, advice, I guess, would be, or the last two things would be, again, I would say that don't think that it has to be one or the other. 
help start a business on the side now, begin building your name recognition, you know, your brand, do a few jobs so that you're building a portfolio slowly, gives yourself time to, to do all the due diligence on the legal, on the accounting side. And now at some point, maybe again, flip, you know, and, and, and go out on your own. And then sort of embedded in what I just said, and I think this is the last one for everybody. And I think this goes for, for anybody, whether you're trying to start a business or not, think about your brand. That could be your brand as an individual. That could be your brand as an organization. But a brand is a very, you know, it's kind of intangible. It's hard to describe. It's kind of like design in a sense that it's hard to put like into words clearly that everybody agrees on, but people know a good brand when they see it. And it's a very valuable asset. Think Nike, think Coca-Cola. Uh, if you begin building your brand, it's an asset that can follow you through the course of your life. And it's something that is much more forward-looking than you know, thinking about short-term transactions. Think about it in terms of you know, the relationships you're building, the, the view people have of you as a practitioner in some given space. Of course, if you start a business and you have a formal logo or brand mark, that obviously contributes to your brand. But just think of it as something that for people to recognize you by, and have faith in and trust in, and that has value essentially. And the longer or the, the sooner you start building that, you're going to be able to you know, leverage that or parlay that into other, you know, other venues that will, I think, create opportunities for you. So I'll, I'll pause there. Oh, Joan, you're muted. I think I saw you. Yeah, ju just unmuted. Thank you. That was wonderful. I mean, I think one of the things that I, I want to ask you to expand on just briefly before we turn to Sue Anna, unless there's another question from someone in the audience. Um, what I'm hearing is this wonderful mix of business knowledge and social science anthropology knowledge. And, you know, which is truly rare. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what your business background and anthropology background together gave you that you think is, is unique and, and perhaps what advice would you give? I mean, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, we need to tell everybody about the small business development corporations, you know, entrepreneur classes and all of that, you know, when we're, talking about LLCs and all of these good things and, and C-Corps, but there's so much more to a business than just, you know, so branding, et cetera. So how did you marry that? How did you, what did you learn from each other? Well, so I, I would just add that, you know, along with the business, I had also the tech background that mm -hmm. I, my technology program was in the business school because I always wanted to manage technology. I didn't necessarily want to be like, you know, uh, a software engineer myself. Sure. And so I had the opportunity to bring both the business and the tech to what I do today. And what I think, you know, some simple things that I think benefit you, you learn about legal structures of organizations, you study business law and you know, something as simple as contracts, right? Which if you're going to get into business, you need to be, you know, you need to understand contracts, you need to write contracts. So you have those sort of very like blocking and tackling things that you need to know when you start a business, which don't get me wrong, I still suggest that you speak with accountants, lawyers. However, having an understanding of that is gonna, is gonna sort of shortcut that process in many ways. That's all stuff you can also teach yourself outside of business school, right? There, there's plenty of resources out there today. Um, even, you know, I'm sure Coursera or wherever, you know, there'd be many opportunities to learn such things today. Uh, the SBDC, as was mentioned, is a, is a great resource in local communities. Uh, but so you have those very sort of blocking, tackling items that are just you know, immensely helpful to know, as well as finance, right? You need to understand you know, how to manage the books of an organization. Uh, even now in rec running my, you know, even you know, as a minority owner in this technology company, now I'm responsible um, you know, for a relatively big book of business, you know, and so while the, the needs are on both sides of my life are a little bit different, you know, being able to understand, you know, the responsibilities on both sides uh, is, is really critical, depending on whether you want to be a small business or you want to scale it. So legal, uh, law, you know, law, accounting, finance, those are like blocking, tackling, great to know. And then, of course, there's aspects like marketing, like you mentioned, which is going to help you gain visibility 
right? Position yourself well in the market. And there's aspects like strategy that you might study, which is going to help you differentiate yourself. So in the case of Art Matcher, the research of anthropology, as well as, you know, research skills from other disciplines, excuse me, other disciplines, was used this time around to not only like, you know, conduct primary research with, with end users, quote unquote, but with humans, you know, who might use the product and other stakeholders in our industry, but also of other intellectual property that existed out there so that we could create a, a sort of strategy grounded in intellectual property since filed a patent on this machine learning based model that I designed that, you know, we believe will give us the ability to protect our position in the market for some period of time, of right. course, not forever. Right. But so, you know, also understanding intellectual property can be of value. And so I think all of those aspects, just having an understanding of that can really help you set up your organization to be competitive, uh, to, you know, to, to have a position that is strategic and that you can protect, to get visibility on you, be seen, to really help you scale. Um, and I would just close by saying that while I think business school was really helpful for what I've done in life, and I don't think it would ever harm somebody for having that in their background, I probably wouldn't suggest like a full MBA to many people, like a mini, if you could find a mini MBA somewhere that might, that would probably be very sufficient, um, you know, or e even just again, kind of Coursera type courses could probably get you a lot of the information you need initially. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunities out there to gain those skills today. Great. Thank you. And I want to now turn it over to Suana and last but not least, um, but before, so we don't lose that thought, um, there are a number of resources now. It, it's, it, as Matt's saying, you don't need to get an MBA. Um, there are a number of programs out there that are free, frankly, um, that can help you learn what you need to learn to develop a business. And there are a number of organizations, particularly the SBD, the, what are they, Small Business Development Centers. Sure which are a, it's federal money to each state, and they're usually have a combination of basic business development programs and mentoring. There's also the senior executives that mentor. So there's a number of different things. I, I went through a program that was through Voc Rehab, which was wonderful. It, taught me how to do a business and a business plan and then gave me startup funds. So lots of resources out there that I think weren't there when, when Neil and, and Kathleen started out. So on that note, Suanna is um, president and principal investigator of Headfort Consulting, which does a lot of things and I'll let her explain that, but she's also taken anthropology into science communication and fundraising. She's an anthropologist and science communication expert who is passionate about creating messages that resonate with global audiences. Uh, she advises universities, nonprofits, and tech startups, along with individual researchers, authors, and artists on ways to connect with the public or to advance scientific and cultural understanding. Her work uses an anthropological lens to amplify discoveries and in data, including a social media strategy that propelled the first ever image of a black hole in front of 4.5 billion people in 2019. These strategies also contribute to a track record of raising more than $12 million for research and facilitating international collaborations before Zoom was a household name. So Anna completed an undergraduate degree in anthropology and archeology span at William and Mary. She finished interdisciplinary master's and PhD degrees in anthropology and geosciences at New York University, pursuing field work in the US, Europe, Middle East, and South Asia. When she isn't thinking about science communication, Solana returns to her roots in geoarchaeology, working and speaking publicly under the nickname Dr. Dirt. So there's a brand for you. Solana, take it away. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to Joanne and Kathleen for including me uh, in the evening. I'm so excited to be able to chat with you this evening. I do have uh, some slides to share. Let me just go into this process with our technological overlords and make sure that we can make it all happen. Okay, you're on. We're on. I'm a big fan of Canva. That's my one preview piece of advice. 
for anyone thinking of starting their own business, um, invest in Canva. <laughs> this is a marvelous piece of graphic design software uh, for those of us who can't really figure out graphic design. Um, so I thought I would um, sort of mini title my, my portion of the talk tonight as entrepreneurship for the uninitiated. And um, the term uninitiated will be familiar to anthropologists. Um, I kind of use it here tongue in cheek because um, I had a, a graduate advisor who um, kind of jokingly called us all the uninitiated until the day that we had done our defense. Uh, and then we were allowed to, to join uh, the ranks uh, of those with, with the higher degrees. Um, but it, if you're here and you are interested, you're, you are attracted to the topic of anthropology of business, you're, you're not necessarily uninitiated. You've got some ideas working in the back of your head um, about how to make something happen um, for yourself, either as an independent person and a business owner, or as a contributor to a larger organization. Um, so just to sort of give you um, the, the background um, on uh, what Headfort Consulting is. Um, Headfort Consulting is my little LLC. Um, it is a business I started in 2018 um, after a few bumps in the road of being uh, an independent consultant and ahead of that being uh, an employee inside of boutique uh, firms. I uh, preface it by saying because my I'm a mom of two daughters and my youngest daughter is extremely proud of it. The name comes from my youngest daughter's uh, place where she likes to do her homework. It's where she feels very smart, very special. She has this little mole hole she builds out of pillows and they, she calls that her head fort. So mom asked if she could borrow uh, the, the brand name. It does sound a little bit like a software company, but I wanted something that just wasn't Suanna Crowley Associates or something. I wanted something a little bit more uh, there, there. Um, but it is a new organization. 2018 is the start date. Uh, it was incorporated um, as an LLC. Uh, I am the um, primary owner as a woman owned business. Um, I share that duty with my husband. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to, to be the anthropological side of the family, uh, but I married uh, quite well somebody who is uh, an MBA himself, um, picked up a business degree from one of those Cambridge universities up here in Massachusetts where I'm located, um, and he's also a CFO of a multi-billion dollar company, so when I have finance problems, I can often go to him uh, for, for some of the help, those things that I haven't tried to learn on my own. So Headfort was uh, created in 2018, and that was actually um, kind of a, a kind of an impulsive response um, to a situation that I found myself in. I had um, been working all the way through graduate school. I did finish um, a degree um, took quite a while to get through um, my my PhD degree. I crossed over. Uh, the 9-11 uh, uh, situation, which was a big impediment, like many people are experiencing now with the pandemic to the impact on their field work. 9-11 came right in the middle of my um, graduate school process, and I had initially started life as um, a Near Eastern archaeologist. So um, suddenly found myself having to learn how to pivot away from uh, the languages and cultures that I had spent a great deal of time uh, working on on and in and appreciating uh, into uh, new, new avenues and discovering my own sense of resilience. Um, but the consulting company that, that I have sort of given birth to as my third child um, is uh, something that came out of long experiences as an independent consultant. And I really felt I, I enjoyed it. I loved being able to contribute as a solopreneur um, a sole proprietor of my own sort of uh, brand of connecting and, and working by word of mouth um, that was primarily in archaeology, in historic preservation, and in my specialty of geoarchaeology. So that's a field that really requires that interdisciplinary look, hard sciences, social sciences. Um, and I do, I do, you're very welcome to call me Dr. Dirt. That is the nickname that I, I answer to um, all the time. But um, the it, it felt a little unmoored, it felt a little disconnected, and I wanted a home, I wanted uh, to build a brand. Um, and 
I think of brands as as stories. I love the way Matt really talked about them. I loved the way um, he ta talked about them as being so central to the process of, of developing a business. But I, I really think of them as something that start to convey the story of who you are, who your business is. Um, when I work with clients, uh, I'll find sometimes that they bristle under the concept of a brand that might be just a little too much for them. And so sometimes I'll refer to it as your, your business identity or your nonprofit identity, um, and, and people can find their way to that. Um, but what I do primarily, what I bring my, um, my archaeology background to, my anthropology background to, is really in looking and uh, designing uh, communications pieces, communications for primarily science organizations. That's where my, my passion is. Although being a good archaeologist, I do help um, historic preservation um, organizations as well. Um, but that, that passion for storytelling um, really came from um, my very first job out of, out of college. I was part of the archaeology department at um, George Washington's Mount Vernon. I'm a native Washingtonian, born and raised. Um, and my first job uh, was in the archaeology department, standing there on the site of George Washington's trash midden, you know, digging things up and learning how to analyze uh, that cultural material to tell the story of who George Washington was. But the team that I worked for, the archaeologists who were there, really wanted the, the archaeology, the junior archaeologists, to spend time in front of the public uh, and talking to them and standing at the edge of um, the square and talking to the tourists who came up and wanted to know what you were doing, standing in the middle of the field next to George Washington's home. And over the course of the summer that I spent there, um, probably over time, over those few months talking to thousands of people, I really realized I loved the storytelling behind what was going on. I could point to the square and describe what we were doing. I could talk about the analysis. I could talk about the discoveries. Um, and I found that I really did have a knack for figuring out you know, 500 different ways to tell people that George Washington did not have wooden teeth and 500 more ways to tell people that, yes, it really was important that we dig the stuff up, even though everything is written down in history. Um, and so that process of, of learning how to communicate, uh, I, got, I got hooked. I got hooked on it. It wasn't something I really did as an undergraduate, but as I moved into graduate school, I realized its value. Um, that ran as an undercurrent um, through my graduate process and into my early working career. Um, I tried to find ways to, you know, volunteer to give the paper, to stand up in front of the crowd and, and interpret what was going on. Um, I found ways to create pitch decks when I worked for small boutique consulting firms and we wanted to pitch work to the Army Corps of Engineers or something like that. I wanted to find ways, more and more complex ways, um, to start telling the story. And as I learned those community pieces, I, I developed a side hustle. And my side hustle was really grant writing and fundraising. Uh, and those are two aspects of um, storytelling that have um, very immediate and usually positive impacts for research organizations or nonprofits. And so here I was a researcher studying dirt, my passion, um, but really beginning to realize uh, in my early 30s that I had this, this knack uh, for telling these stories. Um, and one day as I was, you know, sort of down and out about where my career was going, right about 2008, um, as we were all facing uh, the hurdle of the Great Recession, um, my husband said to me, you know, you've got this sort of thing, this talent, this, this side hustle of, of writing grants and communicating with people. You know, people get paid to do that. And it was the first time I'd really thought of myself as something other than um, uh, an archeologist. So I explored it. Uh, I'm a little bit of a collector of experiences. Um, I like to travel. I like to put myself in the path of complicated things. Uh, Kathleen called them wicked problems. Um, and that really led me to work in museums. Um, and to try out all of these ideas of, of putting 
um, stories and histories and science and discoveries out in front of the public uh, and really test how it worked. So I really realized <laughs> I had a niche. Um, I had something that I could kind of offer the world in a, in a real way. And the lens of anthropology, the work that I had done living and traveling in other places and learning about communication networks and material culture, this really translated uh, and supported uh, the, the, the niche that I was carving out for myself. So in 2018, um, I had a colleague who called and said, we need somebody who can be a science writer. Could you, could you come on board to this project at Harvard? We're in really dire need. And I said, yes. I said, yes, without thinking about it. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into at the time, um, but um, that prompted me to become a contractor, a federal contractor, as an employee of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, and so I had graduated from the independent consultant into um, the, the LLC um, because that was the only way I was going to get paid. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to make sure that I had a little bit of structure around me. Uh, and, and could operate officially even as a contractor uh, to the Smithsonian and the Center for Astrophysics. So I took on this work. I took on the experiment of trying out pure science writing. I was embedded with a group of astrophysicists, not an easy group to work with. They certainly don't always communicate in linear ways. Um, I, my big joke is that I had to break up a fight between uh, a Fields medalist and a MacArthur winner um, because they do squabble from time to time. But again, communication. Um, and I realized that uh, I liked it. I had this knack and I could keep going. So after 2018, um, I started to um, refine that pitch. I started to realize that I had something to offer and I, I could go for it. And along the way, I, you mentioned some of the um, certifications that exist. Um, I did go after the SAM.gov certification. I did get my EIN. Of course, I have my DUNS number. Um, the SAM system has now moved on to a unique identifier uh, as of about three or four weeks ago. So we're all converted into yet another number to keep track of uh, if you wanna become a federal contractor. Um, but all of those things kind of go into that pitch to say, I, I have the background, I have the Secretary of the Interior qualifications, I have an RPA, I'm actually working on a certification called a Certified Fundraising Executive, which is CFRE, so more alphabet soup uh, to try and squeeze into the business card. Um, but all of those things help me um, really uh, go after the kinds of work that I want. Uh, and that really was that independent piece. I kind of, I didn't want a boss. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to do it on my own. I felt strong enough to do it on my own. Um, I've been able to uh, make all of that happen through word of mouth. Um, I don't have a website. Uh, I'm probably the worst consultant ever because I, I've never sat down and really designed the website. I, I live and operate off of Twitter and LinkedIn and I make my connections those ways. Uh, as well as doing um, a lot of pro bono work, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, which will grow uh, into other things. So it's, I, I, I've worked under the umbrella of organizations and I've worked as a freelancer and I've worked uh, sort of for myself under this um, operation of the LLC. And I, I like all three of them, they all have value. Um, and I think I've, I'm not quite settled into my own business ownership. I, I still bristle under the idea of an entrepreneur that still doesn't feel quite right to me. Um, but I, I, as I said, my little Sarah Blakely quote, I, I don't want to be intimidated. I want to go after these things. I want to try them. And that sense of um, needing to find out anthropologically and needing to find out as a business owner, they, they kind of uh, work in parallel to each other. Uh, and they feed off of each other. Um, I think the the best thing probably about um, uh, having this this um, business is that I really get to direct traffic uh, in the way that I want to do it. Um, 
And one of those pieces is uh, sort of operationalizing my anthropology as my skill set. I get to work with clients um, in various kinds of ways. Um, I mentioned that I've, I've helped uh, astrophysicists debut uh, discoveries. Uh, I've also helped um, New York Times bestselling authors figure out how to build the next book. Um, I, I'm working now in a very tech-oriented space um, with uh, voice technology, smart speaker technologies, Alexas. I, I don't want to trigger her. Um, but uh, trying to build out um, new ways for those voice platforms to really work better with nonprofits, not just the for-profit small business world, but really allow uh, new ways for nonprofits to um, access content delivery, access some of those marketing um, aspects of the platform, and definitely think about fundraising opportunities through platforms like these. Um, that being said, I think the advice that I would give people is to really think about moving outside of your comfort zone. You've got an onboard skill set. You know how to observe the world. You can write that world in the way that, that you need to, whether it's... Um, a tweet or a, a full technical report. Um, if you've got the onboard skill to observe and to communicate those things, you, you bring a lot of value as an anthropologist to a lot of different organizations. Um, but I would say that the moving out of the comfort zone, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of that because it's, it's that growth moment for you. Um, I'm, I'm the experienced collector, as I said, but pushing yourself a little bit is something that I highly recommend for people who are thinking about businesses and anthropology uh, sort of aspect. I have to come back to my husband all the time, the finance guy, and say, I know why the numbers aren't working. We need a better system for the people to understand the numbers. Um, uh, and so he, he, he gives me the, you know, that, mm, yeah, 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 I know, all right, let's do it. Um, sometimes my, my clients do that as well. The therapy aspect um, of what I do is, is most of the day sometimes. Um, but when I get to move out of my comfort zone and, and capture a new skill, capture a new experience, see a new set of variables, um, I'm, I'm learning and growing my anthropology as well. That all being said, I stay grounded in archeology. span That's where I'm from. Uh, I'm gonna do it forever. Um, I still get to contribute to uh, research projects here in Massachusetts. I'm starting one uh, actually on a shipwreck uh, that's related to the America 250 uh, anniversary. And I get to do some geoarchaeology from time to time, play in the dirt, dig some cores up, uh, and really um, put my Dr. Dirt hat back on. Um, and I think that if you can find a way to, to honor those roots, even if you move forward, um, you're, you're doing a great job uh, as, a, as a business anthropologist uh, in lots of different ways. So uh, you, can, you can have a good balance between the two. Um, and I think the only thing that I would just close with is my favorite David Hurst Thomas um, quote. If, if you know David Hurst Thomas, he's a, an archeologist. Uh, he was at the um, uh, American Museum of Natural History for a long time. Uh, but I think it works for consultants um, uh, in anthropology, and that is it's not what you find, it's what you find out. Uh, and so it's it's the analysis that you bring, it's the 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 skill set, the openness, um, and the understanding that you can bring as a business owner, as um, a good employee uh, in lots of different sectors. Um, that that anthropological lens is what finds out. Uh, some of the most valuable pieces for people. Um, and I, I really highly encourage anybody who's thinking about a business move, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to help um, direct some, some resources your way. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Joanne. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Okay, um, I am, let's see, let's see, there we go. Let me get the view back to gallery so I can see everybody. Okay. So at this point, um, I think we're just going to open it up to everybody on and um, see what questions people have, discussion, um, anybody. And let's use the hand thing because it actually makes life a little bit easier for those of us who are trying to keep track of lots of screens. 
and aren't very good at it. <laughs> so anybody. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> Actually, I have a question for Jeannie in terms of um, archaeology, because I'm um, quite often tempted um, and, and invited back to archaeology things, um, which I love. And as I said, I'll never leave. I'm kind of wondering, um, you looked at that watershed moment of, of 2008, and, and you talked about um, NHPA being sort of at the 50-year mark, where there's an, yet another big change and turnover in um, practitioners. Wondering what your thoughts are on the federal infrastructure bill and how that's going to impact uh, the field of archaeology in the in the coming five to ten years. I'm seeing a lot of people struggling between student debt to get out and get the degree and be SOI recognized, and yet they're you know booming opportunities that are coming through this infrastructure bill. I'm just kind of wondering what your ask your your thoughts are on that? Um, we are looking very much forward to the implementation, implementation of the American Infrastructure Bill. I, I'm assuming most of the money will just weed down to the states and you know, Maryland gives out cultural resource contracts and we hope to be on several of those. But as an industry, the American Cultural Resource Association is watching it at the federal level and not much has actually gone out now. They have to rule make and all that stuff, but we expect a boom. And right at the moment, there is not a boom in technicians and crew chiefs and field directors. And part of that's because you know, we are have traditionally been a low paid profession and we are working hard, at least on my end, to raise pay rates so that people can afford to do this job rather than just because they love it, but because they can also you know, have a life. But yeah, I, I the, the infrastructure bill was huge getting that through. But if you, if you want to follow along on what the government's up to, ACRA you know, has, has a government relations and we do a yearly visit to Capitol Hill so to, to lobby for whatever it is that's on the cusp, just you know, keeping National Historic Preservation Act and Section 106 in place is a key. And it's been attacked several times. And you know, we, the organization went and gave testimony multiple times. Ah, <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> All right. I think, well, that may be. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, Matt, um, uh, yeah, David's saying, um, can he get in contact for everyone? Yes. I think we'll, we'll post, um, contact information for everybody at the end. Um, or if people want to put that into the chat. That's a good use of chat. So why don't you guys put that information in chat and then WAPA can put it out there again so everybody has it. Okay, so Matt, AKA WAPA DC, um, has his hand up and then Andrea. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think for so many of us uh, that have kind of moved out of academia, uh, I think so many of us have had kind of uh, this, this crisis of faith about, you know, who we are as anthropologists and, uh, you know, the, the name anthropologist, being able to call ourselves an anthropologist. And I think one of the common, and this is maybe more of a comment than a question, but uh, I, f I feel like one of the more, one of the common themes uh, um, among all the speakers today, uh, and this is something that also resonates with me in my own crisis, uh, is finding your identity uh, as a practitioner and, and defining uh, kind of the, the kind of practitioner that you want to be and really identifying anthropology or archaeology as something you do and not necessarily something that you are. I, I don't know if, if you all agree with me on that. that it's just kind of my, my take on it. Okay, who wants to respond to that? Any of any of the panelists? 
Anybody? I don't know. I was, I was, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Matt. No, no, you go. I, I, I was, uh, I think I was an anthropologist before I was an anthropologist. And so, you know, warp and woof. Um, I don't think I had an identity as an anthropologist until Neil and I started working together and we could be in relationship in anthropology using our tools specifically. And I think that, and I'm probably not answering your question, but I think, you know, we have art and science and then we have tools and we have the way in which we interact with the publics. And those are very different pieces of bringing together anthropology and being an anthropologist. Um, that was probably way too... No. Matt, bring us down to ground level. Well, I was gonna say that, you know, I, this is something I, whether as a question or statement, I hear a, a fair amount of discussion on, and I don't think anybody has one single answer that would work for everybody. And I think uh, if you were to look back at me on the internet, you would find that I have, you know, I work in product, right, in UX. So I iterate, I prototype, I test, I gauge how those things are working, and then I continue on in that process. And so if you look back through like anywhere where I'm found on the internet, you will find various bios, various ways of stating things. And it is generally because I'm working to figure out what works best for what audience and what environment. Uh, I, don't, again, don't know that answers your question other than to say that I don't know that you have to get so hung up on it as much as try different things and figure out what works where. And also, I would say that, you know, just keep in mind that as, of course, word of mouth recommendations is always one of the best way to get more business, right? I think most people would would say that for various reasons, but a lot of discovery happens today on the internet. And there are ways of positioning yourselves within information spaces that are more or less competitive. You know, for example, if I was going to try and position myself as a UX researcher, it would be very, very difficult, you know, not saying impossible, but you could get lost in a sea. Whereas if you you know, position yourself as something in the anthropology space, depending on if that works for getting you business, it may actually be much easier from a discovery perspective. Um, so my point is, is, you know, try and, and see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, let me add one other thing to that. Um, I mean, I started out in something that was self-designed for specific reasons, um, but it was, anthropology was something I'd stumbled into as part of it. And it was the complexity and the holism and the whatever of that. And so when I, and then I went to work for a survey research firm, one of the biggest ones, um, Westat. And, you know, I was there for a year doing programming and on the phones and all the other stuff that one does and realized that it was that complexity that I cared about, which is why I went to Temple and essentially built again, another self-designed degree, which was anthro at the center with policy and urban studies and everything else. So to me, you know, I've always had this, these other pieces there. And I think the policy one is probably what I'm best known for. I'm not sure. Um, but you know, it's, to me, I found what anthropology means to me, and that is, in a way, my brand. It's the complexity and the holism as I'm doing all these other things. And so I think each of us needs to find, you know, it's sort of like the elephant and the blind man, find what it means for us. Does that help? Jeannie, anything to add? Susanna? Susanna? Yeah. yeah, I've got... I the original question was, are, are you an anthropologist or do you do anthropology? And I would say my personal identity is I am an archeologist. I love being an archeologist. I love it when people ask me what I am and I say I'm an archeologist. Unfortunately, oh, and I, I consider that my company does archeology. span So 
I'm an archaeologist. My company does archaeology. Unfortunately, I am not a business person. And I heard a whole bunch of advice this evening, learning how to do business properly. And I cannot more than second the mentions of the SBDC. The Small Business Development Centers <laughs> saved my life. They absolutely positively did. Almost everything is free. They teach you all sorts of stuff. They are very, very, very nice. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm an archeologist. I will always, I, you know, when I'm sitting on the beach, you know, reading a book, I will still be an archeologist whether I haven't touched dirt in ages. So. Thank you. Okay. I, I would definitely second that um, because the I've had a couple of um, life altering, almost life ending experiences because of archaeology, um, and I survived them. I mean, Indiana Jones moments with guns and snakes and things. And um, I, I, as much science communication as I do, I will I will never unwind the experiences that I had um, in the field in Pakistan and northern Syria. Um, and elsewhere. Um, and so it is my identity, even though I wear a label of, of something else as a business person. Great. Thank you. Andrea, you're on. Hi, everyone. Hi from Utah, by the way. For those of you that were at SFAA, I saw some of you. <clears throat> I was, I became a member of WAPA years ago when I lived in DC. That's nice. I just want to thank you guys for putting this together. Um, one of the reasons I'm still a member of WAPA, even though I've moved far away, is just my identity as an applied anthropologist, that I don't really fit into academia the traditional ways. And as an organization, you guys are my touchstone for that, far more than SFAA. It's fun to go to those conferences, but you guys have consistently produced content like tonight. Um, I was a small business owner before I became an anthropologist and kind of have found academia likes me. I don't necessarily like academia. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in a postdoc role right now, but I've been considering how to transition out and possibly considering putting together a small business. So tonight has been really helpful for that. Um, I may reach out to a couple of you. This is just more of a statement and a thank you. Um, um, and I'm definitely gonna reach out to Jeannie because I actually have two black anthropologists, well, one an black anthropologist friend, one, two black ar um, architect friends that are all located in DC and another qualitative interviewer who um, does mostly um, storytelling and lived experience research. So I'll put you in touch with all of them. That would be awesome. Thank yeah. Four. I got four for you. I'm going to reach out to you. <laughs> Great. Great. Okay. Who else? Other questions? Anybody? Um, can you be a member of WAPA without living in the DC area? Somebody wants to answer that? Yes. I think that's Kathleen. Everybody's nodding. I think that's a yes. Yes. I am one. I'm an um, active member. Zoom, Zoom rules. I mean, this makes things possible in ways, you know, I've been living out toward Baltimore for a while and driving into that school just wasn't happening. So this is, this is wonderful. Um, I want to raise one other thing. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. We've got, okay. Natalie. Um, as a question comment to everybody here. Um, one of the things that I think is a myth about small businesses is that you put out your shingle and you automatically make money. And of course, that's the opposite. Um, it takes, I, it took six months to do the state's paperwork for an MBE and another six months for them to process it, Right and all of this other stuff and figuring out how to do the business plan and all of that stuff. And then even though you've got connections, you gotta find the clients. So I always say to people, don't do this unless you've got a day job and you started as a side gig, 
or you're retired and you've got some other source of income, or you've got a spouse that has another source of income. So I'm wondering if you guys could talk about that a little bit more about, you know, what are the things that you need to have in place before you put out your own shingle? <laughs> Anybody? I think, Joanne, your, your advice is uh, very important because we've, we've done business conferences for anthropologists in the past, and we take them through an entire exercise of what you need to support yourself for six months, for a year, for a year and a half. Um, the point being that if you're not well-funded, um, you're going to have to pay your health insurance, you're gonna to have to pay your mortgage, you're gonna to have to buy groceries. And there's, there's this kind of belief that if you hang out your shingle, something's going to drop on you. Um, what's gonna drop on you is a load of debt. If you're not, if you haven't already done the advanced planning for development, for creating the form of your organization, you'll spend six months getting your, your forms in place. Those are all things that you can plan out while you still have support uh, without simply you know, taking wing and flying off the edge of a building, which too many people do and then they fail and then it's sad. Um, planning those things out in advance, how you live until that first contract comes in. Right. Neil? There's also that dip. Once you get started, um, you may have a great contract to get you going. It pays everything. You've got money coming out your ears. You've got staff. You've got an office and a contract ends. Right. Now what? Part of the challenge in all of this is what's next and planning for that while you're still doing what you've got a contract or contracts for. And I think that initial burst is, is real heavy. You, you know, you're your boss. You call your hours. You're doing work you want to do. And then you're six months from the end of your contract. You're going, holy cow. Who's going to bring me my next contract? And the answer is nobody. Right. You're on your own. And you've got to start digging. But you dig from the very beginning. And people have talked about creating networks. A lot of us talked about investing in pro bono work. We do this all the time. It doesn't count anywhere except in the goodwill and people remembering you when they really have a need. Uh, we did a training and 10 years later, one of the people that went through it was a major player at a major foundation. And she called out of the blue and said, I remember you and I've got exactly the right project you need to do for us. That kind of investment is gold. But it also means you're paying attention to everybody and not just the people you happen to like at that moment. Right. I, I think one of the things that we have to remember is how much time you need to reserve for finding that next job. I mean, I spent half of today at a bidders conference and then sending out little notes. And the other thing is, I tell people, I want to be a subcontractor. I don't want to have to deal with all the government paperwork for the most part for most of what I do. Um, and so it's been finding the right partners and figuring out who's gonna treat you well and who's gonna include you into the next thing, um, you know, which is huge. Okay, anybody else on this? We've got about, oh, let me see. We've got, probably got about five minute, more minutes. So if we have one more question from anybody, um, Yes, Martha. Um, you just um, jiggled something when you said be a subcontractor. So I'm wondering how many of you subcontract to academics and um, what happens when people publish findings? If you ever get, if you ever get a, you know, um, an authorship other than, you know, somewhere smack in the middle. And if you care. Um, quick answer on that, and then I'm going to turn it over to the others, and then I think Suzanne has a question, too. Um, most academics think I should do stuff for them for free. 
um, and trying to explain that I don't have a salary is so fun. Um, so, um, and I suspect most of us have had that experience. I have one or two people when I was just getting started, I call these my mitzvah people who basically gave me ghostwriting um, to do um, because they were not native English speakers and they were famous and my friends. Um, and I am eternally grateful. And in those cases, you know, when you got to a line where it was, gee, are you giving me a thank you footnote versus a co-author we need to talk? But other than that, that was what I was doing there. Um, I think probably Neil and, and Kathleen and Susanna and Matt might have more experience as a business doing this part of it. Um, I've always said if I'm doing something with somebody, it depends on how much writing I do, you know, whether or not I expect to be a co-author. So anybody else on that one, quickly? No? Suanna? Yeah. I think what I've learned, to, I actually work at the VA, that's my postdoctoral, but it's an applied, but is to say ahead of time what papers you want to get out of it yeah. and claim it early and say, since I'm leading this part, I'd like to lead a paper on this part. So like right now, the mixed methods paper out for a rubric I developed for veterans. And I was like, since I developed it, I'd like to lead the paper on it. And the PI agreed. But not everyone plays nice in academia. So, and that's a reason why I don't like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. some do, some are fairer than others. And I try to find those fair people. I've been lucky here. Yeah. Well, I've gotten more aggressive um, over time, and particularly when I when I invested in the 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 architecture of Headfort, the scaffold of of Headfort, um, that that became my home, and I had to, um, you know, th the unwritten business principle of every business is to continue business. Um, I, I tease my nonprofit um, clients about that, that that's the unwritten part of your mission statement. It's true for, for, your, for your own entity too, you have to keep going. And so if there are opportunities to publish, um, when we come to the table, I, I make sure that they know I, if I'm contributing in the research way, if I'm contributing in some other content driven um, development way, um, that, that it's going to happen. And the revelation for me was, was working with the astrophysicists and they put a thousand people on a paper at a time as authors, co-authors, a thousand people. Um, and they, they are trying to share those opportunities with their students and their, their junior colleagues. Um, and that was not what I experienced in anthropology uh, as, a, as a graduate or an undergraduate, but I think, and maybe, maybe a thousand's extreme, but I think there's certainly more opportunities to be generous um, about the um, ways and, and means of publishing and, and getting junior colleagues and students out there a little bit faster, a little bit better. Yeah. Suzanne. I don't have a question. I just want to make sure that Martha before we go, Martha tells us what's going to happen in June. Okay. Thank you. That was what I was about to turn it over to. Great. Okay, okay. Martha. You I, I, I'm going to I'm going to minimize you all so I can look at this. But um, it's interesting that people were. We have archaeologists. I'm actually feeling a little bad. I was so excited that we were going to be able to get together in three dimensions next month. But now I see everybody's coming from around the world to these meetings, and I'm sorry you can't come. So we're going to have an on-site presentation and tour on the history and community archaeology at a place called Sugarland, which is a post-Civil War historic African-American community in Montgomery County, Maryland. It's going to be led by Tara Tetrol, who's at um, Montgomery College. I believe among other places. Um, and it's gonna be on Saturday afternoon, June 25th. Just watch your inboxes for more information. And hey, if you wanna come from Perth, Australia, we would love to have you in Calgary and California and Boston. That's right. <clears throat> so, and thank you. This was a really wonderful, wonderful panel. Thanks to everybody.
That was great. It was great. Anybody you, have any Andy. last words? I think we've got what one minute? Two minutes. Two minutes. Any last words, anybody? Be loud, be <laughs> proud, be a, be an anthropologist. We're not yes. any non. We are anthropologists and we are professional and practicing anthropologists and we make a difference. That's great. Very good. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much.